Welcome to Frequency Matters, the RF and microwave update. I'm Pat Hindle. I'm here with my co-host Gary LaRude. Happy New Year to most of the audience. Yes. We kick off the year with our January radar and antennas issue. And the cover story is very interesting. It's about a tile approach to AESA radars that MACOM and MIT Lincoln Labs have pioneered over the last few years. And it can be used for both civil and defense radars. But what's different is the traditional approach has TR modules, which are a slat approach that are perpendicular to the antenna surface. Right. This is a tile approach where everything is surface mount and parallel to the antenna surface. And what's unique about this approach is the RF beam forming is actually embedded right into the RF PCB board, and the RF components are surface mount onto the back of it. So it's, it represents a very low cost approach, and MACOM projects that it'll be five times lower in cost for this portion of the radar system, which represents about half the cost of the total system. So very interesting to follow this technology. Yeah, and we have a complimentary article to that written by Analog Devices that talks about digital beam forming, which is another trend that's really kind of revolutionizing the architecture of radar. And in the traditional phased array architecture, you have an analog phase shifter and attenuator. Both of them are controlled digitally, but the signals are analog. Right. With digital beam forming, you can actually convert to digital basically at the antenna. And with the technology today, signal processing, you can do that up well into S-band. And in the future, not too distant future, you could probably do it at X-band as well. There are some trade-offs associated with that, and so Analog Devices does a nice job of kind of describing that architecture and what the pros and cons are. Yeah, it's good. Now there seems to be a flexibility between analog and digital beamforming, exactly where you trade off between RF and digital. Right. We have another article that I think is very interesting. It kind of continues the theme of applying solid state to RF energy applications. This one by the RF Energy Alliance. It talks about uh, using solid state for uh, commercial and residential cooking. And I had a conversation with someone not too long ago who was trying to understand what's the value proposition for the solid state power amplifier. The idea there is it actually adds more degrees of freedom. So you can not only vary the power, you can change the phase, you can change the frequency, and this allows you to kind of modulate the standing wave pattern in the cavity so that you can get a more uniform electromagnetic field distribution. So that's half the equation. The other half of the equation, though, is the food. You know, it doesn't take the same energy to cook a baked potato as it does a steak, and not all steaks are the same either. So it's very interesting. The article goes into some of the electromagnetic analysis, not only from the power amplifier side, but from the food side, and what it's going to take to have uh, consistent cooking in these next generation ovens. So another interesting article. Yeah, something we never really used to talk about, microwave ovens have suddenly, suddenly True. become a hot topic. True. So how about products in this issue? So the MVP was uh, Sivers of Sweden's uh, V-band single chip uh, solution for millimeter wave applications. Mm -hmm. A very impressive chip. It integrates the digital control, the signal source, a full millimeter wave transceiver, and the baseband all into a single chip. And because it operates over the 57 to 71 gigahertz range, it actually operates over this 14 gigahertz of bandwidth that the FCC has opened up in the U.S. for many different applications. So it can support a lot of different applications, including backhaul, remote radio heads, uh, video surveillance backhaul, fixed wireless access, uh, wireless gigabit to the home. So any of these millimeter wave applications can be supported by this one chip. So it's very interesting. Yeah, I was really impressed by that. I didn't know very much about that company until I joined Microwave Journal, and I'm impressed by the kind of work that they're doing. Yeah, some of the uh, semiconductor companies in European market are really doing some interesting high-frequency work. Yeah, definitely. So we have a couple of tech briefs in the issue that I'd like to highlight. One is from Applical. It's a uh, drop-in, uh, single-pole, five-throw, 2 to 18 gigahertz uh, pin diode switch. And it has an integrated controller, so you can control the switching with a TTL signal. It's in an interesting octagonal form factor. It can drop into a PCB. And it's about 8 tenths of an inch across and no more than 2 tenths of an inch high. Wow. So that's an interesting product. The other thing is from DRS Technologies. It's an interesting uh, receiver that actually covers from like 20 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz. And it's used for signal intelligence as well as uh, spectrum monitoring applications. And you can put up to 10 different receiver channels in the box, or you can mix some receiver and transmitter channels as well. In the uh, receive, you can adjust the uh, down convert IF to have up to uh, 100 megahertz of IF bandwidth. So it uh, seems like a pretty functional device. Yeah, I actually saw that at the AOC uh, Association of Old Crows Interesting. Show. 
Yeah, it's pretty small, isn't it's it? It's very small and uh, has a lot of capability. So I think both you and I were kind of watching the web last week of all the stuff going on at CES, wishing we could be in Las Vegas. I know. I wish we covered that show in person, but we definitely covered it online. Right. So I thought we'd take a few minutes to cover CES, both from a consumer product point of view and also from a wireless technology point of view, because there's a lot of news coming out with 5G and IoT. Right. Um, so let's pick our favorite consumer products. All right. um, my favorite was a Faraday Future electric concept car and this is a Tesla S on steroids, <laughs> massive steroids. Wow. It has an equivalent of a, oh, more than a thousand horsepower so it can do zero to sixty in less than 2.5 seconds. All types of sensors so it can do autonomous parking, it can come and pick you up where it dropped you off after you parked. It has all types of facial recognition. You can walk up to the car, it'll recognize you and let you in. Wow. Even sitting at the wheel, it can use facial recognition to determine your mood and adjust the music accordingly. Oh. <laughs> uh, so this really is a far out concept, kind of the future of what we envision cars to be. So did you sign up for one? Uh, it's $5,000 down payment, so I uh, didn't quite make that. My other one is the LG wallpaper TV. Uh, so they have 65-inch yes. and 77-inch wallpaper TVs that are less than four millimeters thick. So they've really taken their OLED technology to the next level. Mm -hmm. And now they're making flexible screens and very thin screens that can hang on the wall like a poster. So I can't wait to see that come out. And that's kind of the future of TVs, I think. Yeah. So how about you for products? So the two that I picked, one is um, the Amazon Echo or Alexa, the AI uh, assistant. Now that's not a new product. That came out like a year and a half to two years ago. But I think what makes it compelling and what the big news was at uh, CES is it's now migrated outside of the home. I mean, you can use it in your home to change your thermostat, turn the lights on and off, and that sort of thing. But now it's actually being integrated into other systems outside the home. So uh, Hyundai and Ford have announced that they're integrating Alexa into future model cars. And um, LG announced a smart refrigerator that has Alexa and integration. And TVs, perhaps, yeah. Right. So we're going to see it in a lot more places. You'll have it in your home, and then you'll have it in your car. Good news. I got one for Christmas. Oh, I've had one. I love it. So the other thing that I thought was really interesting is uh, from Motif. And they have come up with a fitness tracker in a ring format that you wear, obviously, on your, on your hand. And it's waterproof, so you don't have to worry about washing the dishes or taking a shower, uh, swimming in it. It uh, measures the usual things, uh, steps and, and uh, your sleep patterns, also your heart rate. And uh, it's uh, quite attractive. I think people will like to wear it. It's uh, obviously, if you're going to wear something, it's got to, got to be attractive. And uh, it runs about $199, so it's a little more pricey than some of the other uh, form factors. But I think wearing a, a ring and having yeah, it it's much more convenient than will be more convenient. Band, yeah. And they say the battery life is somewhere between three and five days. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. So how about uh, some of the news announcements? At yeah, CES? so uh, for 5G and IoT, which in the wireless sector is important to us, I saw that Intel released the world's first 5G modem, so that was very interesting. And this modem will support both the sub-6 gigahertz range and also millimeter right. wave. And it kind of does the functionality that is specified in the new radio standard that the 3GPP is working on. And also, I think this is kind of uh, throwing it out there against Qualcomm. So it would be right. interesting to see Intel and Qualcomm really fighting it out in this space. And then on the IoT side, um, Skyworks released some LTE solutions for M2M and mm -hmm. IoT applications. So these are LTE mobile and narrowband applications, and it conforms to the release 13 of the 3GPP LTE standard. So it uh, right. can be used in many different applications. How about you? What did you see in 5G? Well, the ones that, uh, that I picked kind of parallel what you're saying. We had an announcement from uh, Qualcomm, Ericsson, and AT&T that in the second half of this year, they're going to actually be doing some field trials, 5G field trials, at 28 gigahertz and 39 gigahertz using spectrum that AT&T has. Qualcomm will provide kind of the device level technology, and Ericsson will provide the infrastructure. Uh, as you mentioned, they're trying to conform to the uh, 3GPP 5G NR new radio standard, and so the timing is such that they'll be able to implement that and then provide feedback to help refine the standard. The other one, Corvo announced uh, seven new Wi-Fi front-end modules. These are uh, power-efficient, high-performance modules. Five of them operate at uh, 5 gigahertz in the 5 gigahertz band, the 802.11ac band, and the other two are for 2.4 gigahertz. And with the performance that they can achieve, these can support up to uh, 1.2 gigabit per second 
per stream uh -huh. at the five gigahertz band. So uh, that sounds pretty compelling and we're seeing bandwidth continuing to increase. Oh, it was a great year for CES, very interesting. Right. So I think that kind of brings us to the start of uh, 2017, promises to be an interesting year. I don't think we've had an M&A announcement yet, have we? Uh, any day now. Any day now. So we want to thank you for watching. We want to thank also our sponsor, National Instruments AWR. Uh, the AWR design environment is used by many design engineers to do the kind of products that, that we talk about here on Frequency Matters. You can find out about their products and their capability at ni.com slash awr. Thanks for watching.